Hello everyone, thank you for checking out my YouTube channel today, The Study of Antiquity and the Middle Ages. I am your host, as always, Nick Barksdale, and today we are joined by a very special guest for a series on race and ethnicity in the ancient world. Dr. Rebecca Futo Kennedy, thank you so much for coming on today. Happy to be here. My next question involves today and classical studies. Is racism alive and well in classical studies? And if so, would you mind giving us some examples of that? So we want to think about what we mean by racism, first off. Um, I think a lot of people think that racism equals overt acts of prejudice, uh, like the expression of prejudice overtly against people. And we do actually see those actions, um, both within the discipline itself and also by people who like the classics, but who aren't necessarily professionals in the field. I think, you know, one of the most recent prominent episodes was what happened at the Society for Classical Studies meeting a couple of years ago, where um, a, a member of the discipline stood up and made this sort of long speech about Western civilization narratives and how we have to recenter, you know, we're the foundation of Western civilization, et cetera, et cetera, and then insinuated that one of the members of the panel, who happens to be one of only a handful, you know, a small percentage of, of Black scholars in the field, only had his position because he was Black. And so it sort of went downhill from there. But, uh, but that also was accompanied by the fact that a Latina and a Black member of the discipline, who I had invited to that conference to receive an award for their work. I was at the time I was the co-chair of the Women's Classical Caucus, and they were there to receive an award for us um, for their their advocacy work within the field. Um, they were um, profiled racially profiled by the security um, at the conference, <laughs> um, and specifically, they had been the, the security had been called by someone at the conference, so a member of our field most likely, who said that they didn't think those people belonged there, and so. So those are just sort of like two very prominent recent incidents that come to mind. Um, one could actually, and this will probably make all of your watchers realize that they should just hate me um, now, is that Victor Davis Hansen is probably one of the most vocal racists in our field. Um, he has a, a blog that he runs and a podcast called The Classicist, where he sort of claims that label, but it's all simply modern anti-immigration discuss discussions now. Um, he's long ago given up actually working in the actual classical world and in terms of his status within the discipline uh, within ancient history he hasn't really published anything since the late 80s that we would consider respectable ancient history um work so he's very active uh in that in that sense so those are a couple of sort of very blatant uh racisms within the field itself and those are the, the things that people always think of when they think of racism but what they don't actually think of are the structural elements within the field that actually work to maintain its whiteness. <laughs> uh, and that's what we might think of when we think about um, <clears throat> where the actual labor needs to take place um, in terms of how do we make a discipline that isn't racist. Um, anthropology is in the same boat, archeology, span um, which straddles classics and anthropology. Um, history less so, but um, ancient history definitely so. Uh, we all sort of struggle with this because we have these structural elements that actually, I mean, I as a first gen college student myself really don't have a place in the discipline. <laughs> uh, I had to sort of get lucky that someone was willing to take a chance on me in graduate school because I didn't have Latin in high school. Um, the languages are used as gatekeepers to keep people, to, to decide who is and isn't worthy of being in the field and what your potential is, whether you're gonna be an archeologist uh, or his, like you could be a bioarchaeologist, and unless you go to an anthropology department, which might make it more difficult for you to break into um, working in Greece and Italy or in the Mediterranean generally, you have to know Greek and Latin in order to get into a graduate program. And so the question is like, why? <laughs> um, and that's one of the structural elements that is, has been a longstanding debate over, because guess which school districts don't have Latin? Usually the most diverse school districts and the, the, the least wealthy school districts and the non-private schools. I went to a school that was 50% Asian and, and Pacific Islander, um, mostly Filipino and Vietnamese, um, but also others. And so, you know, we weren't one of these, like we did have Latin, <laughs> right? So that's actually something like when you go to apply to grad school, they just look at how many years you've studied a language and that's how they decide your potential for success in, in the discipline. And that's how they decide who is and who isn't worthy of getting into graduate programs. That's a structural element that definitely keeps uh, people from getting into the field. Um, but there's also all of the popularizations, um, what I would might call the sort of charismatic authority of the field, right? 
um, outreach programs, the History Channel, uh, video games, movies like the 300, uh, the Western civilization narrative itself, which we would actually maybe not a charismatic uh, authority, but really more of a traditional authority, but that it, it's used in these sort of charismatic elements that, that, uh, that are explicitly white supremacist. <laughs> Uh, and they have roots in, in, in the U.S. Uh, in particular in white supremacist narratives and anti-Black narratives, right? So things like um, how we treat slavery in the ancient world is often in, fully informed by slave um, apologism in the 19th century. Uh, it's still in our Latin textbooks. It's still in our history textbooks. Ways that we represent why, why are Scotsmen, no offense to the Scots, but why are they playing Greeks in a movie like The 300? Um, why are they playing Spartans? Um, <laughs> they're not Greeks. <laughs> um, Greeks themselves, modern Greeks, are written out of the, uh, of, of the ancient world. Um, so there's whole levels of that that happens in the popularization. Like, why do they always want to make Achilles blonde? Well, because the word Xanthus appears in things, but Xanthus doesn't mean blonde, necessarily, right? That's a, we have to remember that our dictionaries are made in the 19th century, and they're ideologies are inherent in that. So unless you're willing to break the lexicon and actually look at the broader context, both of the creation of the meanings of those words and the context in which they appear, you're going to reproduce these racist narratives. So there's, those are the two sort of types, the sort of structural and perpetuated sort of on the down low that, that pretend to be neutral, and then the sort of blatant uses of classics and classics within the discipline, but also the uses outside of the discipline to promote racist, overtly racist, um, ideas.